So mathematicians using some what we call perturbations, changes in the orbit of Uranus, predicted the discovery of Neptune. They tried to do it with Mercury, and they were close, but in a different way. So what about looking at Neptune's orbit? Yes, so you look at both Uranus and Neptune and try and see, is there something further out? That's right. And again, the period is so long, this is a hard observation to make. Um, but as the early, late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, astronomers were focused on this. That's it, right. It was very exciting. You've got new Le Verrier and Adams very famous 100 years back. So let's try and do this again. Um, but it's clear that anything further out there is going to be even fainter. That's right. And so... This is getting to the stage where eyeball astronomy is not going to cut the mustard. Just yeah, because at Uranus we're looking at like 8,000 objects, Neptune we're looking at hundreds of thousands of objects, so presumably further out we're looking at millions, millions if not more. And it's going to be faint, and so um, luckily as, the 20, as we into the 20th century we had bigger telescopes, like yep. this one, this is the one that discovered Pluto That's right. at the Lovell Observatory. Looks quite dusty here in this picture. Um, but what they were now using is photographic plates rather than having an eyeball at the end of it. Okay. So this thing at the back here, you'd put a photographic plate in, like a giant piece of film. Yep. You close it up, open the shutter, expose for some while, close the shutter, then take it away to the dark room. And this meant you could expose for large periods of time and see things that you can never see with the human eye. Ah. I mean, once your human eye is dark adjusted, which can take up to an hour, so if you're doing stargazing, you want to be outside for a good long time because yeah, your yeah, eye get better and better. You never go and stare at things for the first five minutes. You need to wait multiple. That's right. Yeah, but once you've got dark adjusted, it doesn't matter if you look for a minute or an hour or a week, you're not going to see any more. That's right. But with a photographic plate, you can expose for hours or weeks in principle. Every night you'd line up on target, open for all night, close it again, line up the next night and keep going. Um, and therefore get very long exposure times. And that's another way to collect more of the light. Because essentially, as we said, this is just a light bucket, so you just have your bucket open for a longer period. So you have a bigger telescope, so you collect more light that way, and you expose for longer with your photographic plate, and that also allows you to see more. And also, there are now techniques you can use. You don't have to try and stare at it at the time and see, is that moving, is it a disk? What you, they did is use a device called a blink comparator. Ah, yes. So this is, again, very similar to what you do now looking that's at supernovae. Right. Um, so what they would do is take two images of the same part of the sky a few days apart and they'd have this device and so they'd put one plate here and one plate on that side and this would have optics that would flip backwards and forwards. I think there's a mirror in the middle that flips backwards yep. and forwards. So you see one and then you see the other apparently in the same place, blinking backwards and forwards. And what you've got to do is look for things that move, or not in, the, not in both. So it's essentially astronomical spot the difference. Yes, okay, so let's try it. This is a puzzle for you, okay. All right. This is some of the original data that Pluto was discovered from. So this is kind of like a scan of one of the original discoveries. That's right, yes. So there's a whole bunch of things. Stars, but yeah. I'll tell you for free, there is Pluto in there somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah, it'd be a cruel trick if there wasn't, but I'm glad there is. Yep. Okay, so one of the dots there is Pluto. Yep. And here is an image taken a few days later. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to blink them backwards and forwards. So, I mean, I, I do see some changes, but, you know, for instance, some of these are mm, getting Faint turn brighter, but they're not moving. Yeah, so this, sec this image looks brighter. Yeah. Uh, that's probably was clearer night scale, maybe a longer exposure or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, th and there was the second image is a bit fainter. But I'll give you for free. Um, see that dot there? So, right here. Okay, yep. Yep, and it's so gone. It's definitely, yeah, it's definitely not there. So, so we go back, it's there, and yep. now it's not there. There, and not there. Oh, wait. But I think I now see something. Here, yeah, yeah right there. There's a there. dot there that's there in the second one, but wasn't there in the first one. So, so it's, there's one here and nothing here, but now there's something here and nothing there. So is that Pluto? That is Pluto, yes. So here it is with some arrows. <laughs> um, and um, what they would do is, uh, Clive Tombaugh who discovered it, that's right. would take photographic plates of large chunks of the sky and then blink them, and then take more pairs of plates and blink them, and he went on for many years doing this, and eventually he picked this up. I mean, well done him, it wasn't that obvious. No, it's, it's not very obvious, you're right, you expect this to be some brilliant big thing, but you're looking at a very subtle thing, and you don't know how bright it's going to be, you don't really know how fast it's moving, because you don't know its orbit, so you kind of have to look at everything repeatedly, and as you said, there's different conditions. Sometimes even the moon, right, can affect the brightness of object or yeah. you said clouds or 
who knows? Now, with this technique, it was still not feasible to do the entire sky. No. Because um, there would be, you know, at this sort of brightness, many millions of objects over the entire sky. But people had got a mathematical prediction. They, looked, they claimed that the orbits of Uranus and Neptune were not quite what they should be. And yep. that meant there would be another fairly heavy thing further out. And they told the people where to look. This time it was kind of like, not a precise, but somewhere over there. Still hard, but a lot better than anywhere in the sky. And that's what Tom Ball's doing. He was taking photographic plates, systematically working his way across that area of the sky. And he found this, and it was in the right place. Yep. So, yay! Once again, the mathematicians predict where it should be, and it's seen. But... That's Pluto. The trouble was, yeah. right away, it was a lot fainter than people were thinking. Yeah. And every other planet, when they discovered it, looked like a disk. This is like a dot. Yeah. I mean, this image was taken by a spacecraft close to it. To any ground-based telescope, it's a dot. Yeah, I mean, if that... I mean, even a small telescope in the backyard can no longer see Pluto. It is that faint. You need a fairly big telescope, and even with a big telescope, it's just a dot. Oh, yeah, I mean, I remember the first image of the Hubble. It still looked like a bigger, blurry dot. It wasn't anything special. Yeah. So here's the brightness. We're now down around 15th magnitude. So yeah. that's 10,000 times fainter than the human eye can see. I mean, this is dramatically fainter than Uranus and Neptune. Yes, so it's you know, several thousand thousands of times fainter than Neptune. So this is a bit puzzling because the, the mathematicians were saying this thing had to be fairly massive. It was maybe a bit less than Neptune, but still maybe half of Neptune or something to be able to warp right. the orbits the way you're seeing. I mean, it's, regardless, whatever it's going to be, it's still likely to be much bigger than, say, the Earth. As we said, some of these may be super yes. Earth or something like but that. But this is way smaller than the Earth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like 1% of the Earth or something like this. And um, as we now know, people originally thought Pluto it was, a, it was the ninth planet. And this is when it got its status as planet. People thought it was going to be big, but it was a bit puzzling that it seemed so faint. But it could be faint because it was very dark. Maybe it was covered in some black sort of rock yeah. and that made it... F and why didn't it show a disk? Why did it look like a dot? Maybe it was small but very dense? It could be. Because it was in the right spot, right? They yeah. predicted the orbit just as they did with Uranus and Neptune, and it was in the right spot. That's right. Um, and people kept... Um, kept thinking about this, as time went on and more data came in, it became steadily clearer and clearer that Pluto could not be big enough to explain the warpings of the orbit of Uranus and Neptune. So... And it was... Each measurement found it was smaller and lower mass. Eventually, uh, its moon was discovered. Yes. And once you've got this moon, Shara, and look at them orbiting around each other, that allows you to work out the mass of them both. And then it turned out it was like 1% of the mass of the Earth. That's totally true. insignificant. However... It also became clear that the claimed wobbles in the orbit of Uranus and Neptune weren't actually real. Oh. Because, again, there wasn't that much data on them. That's right. And a lot of the data was a bit ratty, and it all depends whether you believe some of the pre-discovery observations yes. and how accurate they were. And as you got better and better measurements, the effect seemed to get smaller and smaller. So and it then it turned out that they'd got the orbit of uh, the mass of, I think it was Uranus or Neptune, wrong. And when one of the Voyager space probes went past, they discovered it was actually a few percent less massive than, expect, uh, than okay. previously thought. And that explained away the entire thing. Ah. So the model they thought was right, which led to the prediction in the right area, just happened to be luck? Yes, it was just a fluke that they discovered something... Uh, but the thing they discovered wasn't enough to produce what they thought they were looking for anyway. But there and, was something and, there. And there actually, and there actually wasn't anything, wasn't actually anything to be explained because the orbits of Uranus and actually do precisely match what you would expect. It was just they had bad observations yeah. and wrong mass and so then, a bit confused. So why does Pluto exist? This is part of the problem now. I'm troubling. Yeah. Okay. 